Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have an outstanding guest this week. He is the three-time U.S. champion. He has written some great chess books. Uh, He's a coach as well. Well Well-known, I think, to most of our listeners. Um, GM Joel Benjamin, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ben. It's uh, good to be here. So, Joel, you've you've been someone I've wanted to get on for a long time, of course, because you're a very strong player, and you've also just had a, a... a wide variety of experiences in the chess world, ranging from working on the Deep Blue team to being, you know, an active and competing chess, mas- chess grandmaster to uh, the books you've written. And speaking of books, uh, the the proximate cause for your joining us this week is you just released uh, Better Thinking, Better Chess, which as we speak is available in, kin- in Kindle and Amazon says it will be available uh, in paper form by Christmas. I already read it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, so, Joel, what was um, what was the impetus for this latest book of yours? Um, well, um, th- this book really came about uh, from my my work as uh, as a, uh, a private teacher, as a, um, a team coach, and a lecturer at camp. Um, because you know, when I would give the lessons, I, I always like to get feedback. I like to I like to try to figure out how how the uh, the players are thinking and approaching a position, and what I what I came to understand is that a lot of mistakes and made are made in chess not because of lack of knowledge, but because of flaws in the thinking process. For instance, I found that a lot of my students, say rated around the the, uh, the expert level, would play the first move that popped into their head. Now, it's not like they just played it, you know, within 10 seconds like a beginner, but they'd look at a position, they'd find a good move, and they'd say, oh, okay, I can't find anything wrong with that, I'll just play it. So we'd go over a game, and I'd say, okay, well, why didn't you play this move? And the answer would be, I, I didn't see it. And I'd say, well, why didn't you see it? And they'd have to admit because they didn't look for it. So the, the bottom line on this book is that it's it's uh, it's a strategy book that's not so much um, you know content based you know like teaching about um, you know tactics or pawn structure or anything anything like that but how to take what you know and put it all together and think more clearly and efficiently during your games and thus maximize your results. Okay, yeah, and I'm certainly guilty of the the problems you describe. I oh, kinda, and I am too. <laughs> yeah, I, I I generally fit in that rating box. I mean, I'm 21 to 2200, and sometimes, and I, I think I've talked about this before, but when I compete, sometimes I just I like you say I miss moves. Um, so you you talk about what you think some of the antidotes are in in the book, but do you mind uh, giving a little taste of our for our listeners of some of your recommendations? Well, one of the things is that, you know, don't, don't take shortcuts. As I said, you know, don't play the first move that pops into your head. Um, I, I think the, the first minute or two of, of your think is very often the, the critical stage is, you know, is, is to start by noticing your possibilities uh, and, and, and not zeroing in on one move too quickly and, and not noticing other stuff. Um, also, um, you, you know, uh, one thing I talk about is is I, I reference uh, you know that uh, the great book from from my old friend Charlie Hurtan, forcing chess moves, and and I say like one of the great things about the book is the title. You know, it's just the idea that you start by looking for forcing moves. You know, you look for moves that that uh, attack pieces and take pieces and checks and stuff, and so you you make sure that you always give at least some attention to those types of moves at the beginning, even if you reject them quickly, just to be aware that they're there because they, they can matter more than you, uh, than you notice at first. So that's, that's just a couple of things, you know, that, uh, that pop up in the book. And as someone, so you, you said that you're no stranger to these mistakes yourself, but I would imagine that as, as such a strong player, you're less familiar than, um, 
than someone like me and then than most of your students, even though your students, I know a lot of, especially the, those that you teach privately, are strong up-and-coming players with a lot of potential. Um, so do you notice anything, like, is their progression the same as yours was when you were a young player? Or is there uh, something that needs to be ironed out that you didn't deal with yourself? Well, the thing is that every every chess player is different. And this, for me, is, is the, the major part of my teaching philosophy. Uh, it's very much in contrast to, let's say, the Soviet style of teaching, where the, the coach just presents material and basically tells the student how terrible they are, that they don't <laughs> understand anything. But, you, you know, you have to... Uh, you know, like what, what, when, I, when I take on a new student, the first thing I do is I say, okay, send me, let's say, 30 of your most recent games. And I look at the games and I try to figure out what type of player this is. Because ev- everybody has a different progression. You know, like, um, you know, like, uh, you know, my, my star student, John, uh, John Burke, mm-hmm. who, you know, frankly, d- you know, d- doesn't need me anymore because right. I think he, I think he's higher rated than me now. Um, he, you know, like when he was nine years old, he was amazingly good tactically. And it's not just like nine-year-olds are good tactically, like they uh, they see things. It's that he calculated. And a lot of kids don't even calculate. They just don't want to. Yeah. So that was never a problem, you know, getting him to calculate, you know, like that. that, that so he was great in that area. But with other students, you know, sometimes they would like to play on feel, and they they wouldn't calculate enough, or they they make you know those uh, sloppy errors. So um, so every student is different, and um, and in the book actually I present games played by by my students, you know, and mistakes that they made, and of course you know with, with the the uh, the statement that these are really strong players and they make mistakes less often than other young players do but um but it just kind of shows the typical things that even strong players have to have to go through and of course there's some of uh not only my successful games there are also some mistakes for my games as well yeah it's funny that you should mention john michael burke because i'm i'm familiar with his name being that i you know follow follow chess pretty closely and he's been uh rising rapidly but the other day i was trying out a puzzle rush on chess.com which of course i don't know if you've had a chance to check this out but uh, i've been hearing people talk about it yeah Yeah, it's um quite an addictive little uh format where tactics are presented and when when you do it they show the leaderboard in real time so i was just checking out all the all the gms at the top and uh, john uh your student was uh i mean that's it's not it's not an all-time leaderboard that they show at that moment it's like the real-time leaderboard but there he was like right at the top speaking of uh tactical ability um but i also wanted to ask you so you mentioned that you use a lot of your students games which i think is refreshing because you've got a lot of your own games over the years but also i mean you see people's names in the book that i'm not accustomed to seeing in the chess book especially being we were talking before we recorded we both live in new jersey and have been in uh new york over the years so we probably know a lot of the same players but i, w- I was curious uh, so in terms of selecting the material how do you go about it like is it from the bottom up or from the top down do you see a game and say that needs to be in the book or do you have a theme and then just have to sort of comb through the memory banks of what illustrates that theme it was a little bit of a little bit of both um and it was kind of like that with my end game book as well it it's it's uh you know like you see a game and uh and that's okay yeah that's that's an example of a certain type of flawed thinking and that triggered the book in the in the first place and so there are a number of number of games that really kind of jump out as as uh, as uh, needing to go in there, and then I would you know look around to to flesh, to flesh things out and and to, to to try to get also fair represent, representation of the students because I didn't want to have you know show like you know fifteen mistakes from one student and right. two mistakes from the other. So you know I tried to be to be fair. Uh, in that sense. But, you know, sometimes I have students that are actually, you know, really good in in providing games that uh, with with sort of instructive mistakes. And sometimes I have students that really aren't so good at that. And it's not necessarily the case that the the first the first type of player is weaker than the other. It's just that some players are, are, are steady and some players are, you know, more up and down. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so, well, sorry, we're gonna let that noise pass. <laughs> um, so, um, how long does it take you to write a book like this, Joel? Uh, I, I don't really remember exactly, but I'll say something like like six months. Uh, I, I would say that this was. Uh, uh, I published four books now. This is uh, this was the hardest one to write because because the um, the subject matter is kind of amorphous. You know, like I said, how to think in chess. You know, and because uh, I couldn't call it think like a grandmaster because that's, that's that's obviously taken, taken yeah. already. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's it's just it's just a very kind of wide ranging topic and try try to kind of pick out the things about thought that uh that i think are 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 most important and uh and and useful for the book so uh, you know opposed to let's say you know liquidation into a pawn ending that's a very specific um subject so i just you know that was very easy to research you know this one was was uh, was a, a bit harder but also there were there were certain topics that that went in the book because you know they were just you know particular things that uh that that uh that that came to me like one of the chapters is called material and initiative and like one thing i uh, i've noticed over the years is that players let's say players below the 20, 2300 never sacrifice the exchange they just don't do it unless i highlighted a, that when i highlighted that in the book i found that interesting right unless it's unless it's a mate unless it's a mate or a uh or you win back material you know, like one of one of my uh, one of my star students, uh, I guess, was in, uh, not in the book, but um, you know, uh, was in this this big competition, and uh, he shows me this game where uh, he's got a fiend cat of the bishop, and he pushes up his his e pawn, and you know, attacks something, and takes the guy takes a pawn, he takes a rook in the corner, so he he wins. I'm making air quotes now. He wins the exchange. But then he has these horrible light squares, and he's like in danger of getting mated, and he has to do hoops, run through hoops the the whole rest of the game. And you know he was already you know like master level, but you know because of lack of experience, he didn't understand that exchange meant nothing. You know, right. so you know some players understand this kind of strategy um, sooner than others, but. Um, but uh, that that's that's part of uh, you know what, what that chapter is about to make people understand that material is not more important than everything else. It's just a feature of a chess position. And that uh, I, I found that, you know, the players below the master level, you know, like if you would attack a pawn, they would have to defend that pawn. They could not, couldn't think of not defending the pawn or letting you take the pawn. And, you know, like if you look at high-level grandmaster chess, and I talk about guys that are really beyond my level, is they just give away pawns right and left. Right. You know, they don't think about it. Yeah. You know, and some of these pawn sacrifices say like, well, that's actually a little bit too deep for me. You know, they just say, well, okay, I just have, I just have, um, you know, my pieces are a little bit better mobilized and I have a little bit of time to do something. And a pawn, it's going to be a long time before that makes a difference. So that was kind of something that I, that I realized you know, that until you start coaching, you may not realize that, hey, you know, everybody out there doesn't realize, you know, how useful an exchange sacrifice can be. So there's, there's a chapter that, so there's a chapter there that you know, has a lot of, um, you know, s- types of sacrifices, but also just showing, you know, like how, you know, like how a player gets in trouble because of instinctively defending a pawn when they need to let the pawn go to achieve something else. So um, that's actually one of my favorite chapters because I think it's probably something that's almost never been explored in the literature. Yeah, I mean, I can, the only example I can think of is uh, Jonathan Rousen in uh, Seven Deadly Chess Sins talks about materialism as one of the sins. And, you know, that put that on my radar when I read it, but I'm still just as guilty as anyone else. There's sort of, I mean, you spend so much time as a developing chess player trying not to hang stuff <laughs> that uh, you you just get an uh, materialism ingrained, and another sure. um, another very instructive uh, 
strong player is uh, Alpha Zero. I mean, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a ton of its games, but it's uh, as you say, giving away material left and right for. Yeah, but but nobody understands what Alpha Zero is doing. It's it's actually not very instructive because it's just wins. But you know why it's doing these moves? I, I you know I just looked at that match that uh, you know that it played against uh, you know that that rigged match against Stockfish, and I didn't understand anything it was doing. <laughs> I, gotta, what, I have to follow up on uh, you're calling it a rig match. So uh, what what didn't you like about the the format? Well, because because it wasn't like Alpha Zero challenged Stockfish and the the owners of Stockfish put their program forward. You know, they just grabbed a commercial version of uh, an available version of Stockfish and decided what the conditions of the match were going to be. So it was somewhat rigged. It's, it's not it's not to say that Alpha Zero isn't capable of beating Stockfish, but. You know, it just some of the parameters of, of the match were were arbitrary. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but, and I yeah, and just to clarify, obviously, I'm not saying I can understand everything that Alpha Zero does, but I do feel like with the fact that it's making so many sacrifices, at least uh, uh, lends credence to the point that uh, that players um, below the 2300 level are probably clinging to their material a little too tightly. Yeah, but Alpha Zero is doing it because it can see to the end of the game. Whereas masters don't see to the end of the game, they just they just understand that they don't have to, and that's what the the the, the weaker players can't do. They feel like they say, "Yeah, I saw I could sack the exchange, but I, I didn't know it was going to happen," and that's their reason for rejecting it. They just you know it didn't lead to anything, so that they so they just don't do it. But I, I want to jump in here with a point because you you brought up that that book by Rousen and. Um, uh, one of my editors uh, asked me about uh, about a bibliography for the book, and there there isn't one because I I just didn't use other sources. I didn't use other sources because I thought that if I if I actually tried to educate myself and read up on other people, then I'd start to say I'd be too much influenced by it, and the book would be too derivative. So this book really comes out of my own ideas. And experiences, which is not to say that they're 100 percent original ideas. Of course, you know, other other strong players and thinkers have come up with these ideas as well um, uh, and maybe presented them a slightly different way. So I don't want anybody to say, oh, he just copied that from some. I certainly did copy it from anybody because I did not really read other books. And I don't, I don't say that as a virtue I'd say that probably I should, uh, you know, I should read uh, more of the the available material out there. But uh, once I once I had the idea to write the book, I really didn't didn't want to be influenced um, by uh, by other people. So um, so that's uh, that's. Uh, but uh, but what I think about this book, much much like the liquidation book, is that even though you know parts of it are are, are you you would say like oh well there was a book about that there's a book about that but. I, I, I feel like the, the totality of the book, all these different subjects have not been presented together in a book before. And, uh, you know, they, you know, I could be wrong about that, but I but I, I don't think that, uh, that 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 type of presentation has come before. Um, yeah. Uh, I, thanks for the clarification. Yeah. And I think that anyone who reads this book will see the material. The positions, as I mentioned before, are so fresh that, uh, that it's definitely it's. It's presented in a different way than than any chess book I've read, and I I really benefited benefited from it and suffer from a lot of the uh, afflictions mentioned in it. Um, so I wanted to quickly touch on your other books, Joel. So you you said four books. Uh, does that count uh, unorthodox openings? Yes. Okay, because I go yeah. way back. I, I mean, I mean, uh, I, wrote, I wrote that book. I mean, it was it was back in the eighties, and it was. Um, you know, I wrote that book with with, with Eric Schiller, and uh, who, who unfortunately recently passed away. It's a, a terrible shame. Um, but uh, the, one of the reasons why Eric was so popular as a co-author is because it, you know, it was nineteen eighties. He had desktop publishing. Mm-hmm. You know, people today can't can't really picture how hard it was to write a book back in the nineteen eighties when. People were just starting to get computers that that had you know word processing, and there was no internet. You know we didn't have the same tools, so you know he had the tools that made it uh, you know a lot uh, uh, easier to write a book. But I have to say, I wrote that book 
um, I'd say, I think I wrote it over two years. I started writing it in 20, at 21 and finished it at 23. And I was like a different person. I, I thought about chess completely differently. And I was extremely dogmatic, you know, because I, I would, um, you know, I would, I would look at an opening and say like, okay, now I'm going to refute it. And, you know, remember, this is, there's no engines. Nobody has an engine back then. I'm just going to analyze and right. refute the Chigorin's defense. And, of course, it was ridiculous, you know. And, and the great irony of it is that after writing that book, which was basically, you know, like uh, what to do if your opponent throws some junk at you, I actually became very well known for playing unorthodox openings because I started to look at chess in a different way. Yeah. Well, I think... Um... As you say, it's uh, certainly views have changed since then. But but I love the book when it came out. I, you know, as you you may remember, I grew up and went to the same school as Greg Shahadi, and we we loved that book. We would laugh at openings like it, the, like the cabbage. It, <laughs> it was it was an entertaining book, but yeah. Uh, but all in all, I would say it probably was my fourth best book. Yeah, and and just uh, so you, uh, American Grandmaster, I'd like to discuss later. I love yeah. that book, and yeah. you've you, and you mentioned before we were recording, you've got um, an updated version of uh, Liquidation on the Chessboard coming out as well. Right, I have uh, just uh, put the finishing touches on that and sent that off to the publishers. It's uh, it's I, I don't know exactly what they're calling it. Maybe a new and improved version. Um, it's it's got all of the material from the uh, the first book, but it's got more than fifty new positions. And uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, further exploration of of of, uh, of end game themes. So uh, you know, certainly collectors are gonna are definitely gonna want to have to have this uh, this edition. But if you if you haven't, you know, if you didn't buy the first one, this is a great opportunity because this is is the best. This will be the best liquidation uh, cool. best liquidation out yet. And I guess we can look for it in a few months. Yeah, I think that will be out in, in the spring. Sometime okay, in the spring. cool. Looking forward to it. Well, Joel, I, I, we could talk about your books all day, but if you don't mind, I want to take a quick break and then discuss the World Championship, of course. Sure. I'm excited to announce that this week's episode of Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chessable. If you're a regular listener to Perpetual Chess, you've probably heard me and our esteemed guests extol the virtues of Chessable even when they were not our sponsors. Chessable uses learning science to help you improve your chess as efficiently as possible. It's a great way to remember more ideas faster, even for a middle-aged dad like me. What's more, they're an open platform where anyone can publish their courses. I'm talking to you, chess teachers and coaches. And they paid out hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions to their partner authors. They have big plans for 2019. So if you're a student, author, or coach, be sure to check out chessable.com. So, Joel, I forgot to mention in the introduction that you do a show for ICC uh, where you go over games and do banter blitz and all that sort of thing. And I know that you did a recap of uh, the some of the world championship already. But for, for those that didn't catch it or for any new impressions you formed, could you tell us sort of what your, you, you know, the first thing that when you reflect back on this match in a couple of years, you'll you'll think about? Well, the, the the match in a lot of ways the match went as I as as I predicted I, I said all along as, that that uh, Carolina was not was not inferior in classical chess to Carlson he'd been playing fantastically all year uh, under in a lot of pressure situations and Carlson had really been more or less kind of waiting for this match to happen and you know people out there don't realize it's not that easy to just turn it turn on your game like a switch. Um, even the best players in the world, I can say for me that, you know, when I start winning a couple games in the tournament, then I play with a lot more confidence and, and I just, I, I get on a roll and Carlson, he could never get on the roll in the match. You know, from game one, he had a winning position. He achieved a winning position pretty early and he did nothing with it. He not only didn't win it, it was just it was just a matter of it's not like he miscalculated something or made a mistake. It's that he just he just kind of couldn't pull the trigger. He could just couldn't do what he needed to do to to uh, to finish uh, Fabiano off. And that really set the tone is that he never played with confidence. And when he had the white pieces, he was able to achieve nothing whatsoever. The only momentum in the match that was generated at all was when Fabiano had white. And sometimes he generated negative momentum, you know, that he actually got himself into trouble. But, the, you know, the most interesting games 
came when when Fabiano was white. So, you know, there were a couple of missed opportunities. There was that really, really difficult win to find in that in that crazy ending with the extra piece, which is it's an it's it's an explainable. It's not an it's not really an alpha zero kind of thing. It is it is explainable why Bishop H four wins. But it's very, very hard to see that in a game when you got 10 minutes, unless you know you have a winning move. Right, at that then moment. You can, yeah. Then you can spend eight minutes looking for it. And, and he would find it. He would figure it out if he knew to look for it. That's one of the things about the book is, you know, <laughs> the, the book I just wrote is knowing when to look, when, knowing when to take your time and look for these things. But there was nothing, that, there was no signal to look for that. So, you know, that was a great opportunity. I would say practically the biggest opportunity was in that uh, first Sveshnikov game when he had the big advantage and he hesitated with H3. And so that was the problem, is that he he really kind of, um, uh, he had the, you know, like they would say in soccer, he had the run of play in, right. in, in the 12 games, but he didn't score a win. And the other part, the other part of the match, which I predicted was, everybody predicted, was that Fabiano would have a difficult time in fast chess and unfortunately that was true and so for me it just all kind of leaves a little bit of a bad taste you know that you had this really tense extremely even match and then you you shift to a different type of chess entirely and then it becomes a rout it just uh just didn't seem right to me yeah, although I th- I do feel like the chess world generally is still sort of casting about for the solution because uh, it's true that it's a different format and Magnus clearly has an advantage in this format as it happens. But in the past, the format of uh, tie goes to the champion I- isn't perfect either. Uh, so it's not it's not entirely clear to me what what should be done. Do you, do you have uh, any um, fresh ideas? Well. It- it, it isn't perfect, but I, I think from from a chess point of view, it's better. Um, the only thing is that you know, if, if you're talking about a casual fan or the general public who maybe never you know know they know how to play chess, let's say, but they never really thought about it before. Uh, I think you know people would say like, yeah, this is great because you know it comes down to this tie break. They got uh, tremendous TV ratings in Norway. Everybody loved it. It was very entertaining. But, oh, my God, it's just horrible. I, you know, I just, <laughs> as a chess player, I just think it's horrible. So I think, you know, they really should just, they just, they should have longer matches. And the challenger, okay, so there's a little bit more on, on the challenger. But it was really the same thing here because, you know, realistically, Fabiano had to win the game and tw- had to win the match in 12 games. So why not make it a longer longer match and and the 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 tie goes to the champion? I think what you could even have is is let's say a, a certain length of the match, like twelve or sixteen games, and then go to I, I would go to sudden sudden death um, uh, tie break, but in classical games and play let's say four classical games, and at the end of four games, if no still nobody has won. Then the match is over, and you give it to the uh, the champion. the The only problem with that, I can see that it's never going to happen, is because uh, organizationally it's a mess because there's such a great gap in in the in the possible length of time of the match. So it, it would never happen. But I think from a you know uh, a competitive uh, point of view, it would be great. Yeah, and two other things I'd like to highlight just that I've heard people mention that I think would be positive changes is I do think it's a little too many rest days. I mean, us weekend warriors, we have to play six games in three days or whatever it is. Uh, obviously, it doesn't need to be that extreme, but but I think um, uh, maybe three days on, one day off. Yeah, for a 12-game match, it's not very long. It's kind of funny because I was thinking about the, the, the logistics, you know, that if you had more games, you know, the match, you know, could take, you know, uh, a month, month and a half. So there would be an argument that, well, if you cut down the rest days a little bit, uh, then it wouldn't be so long. On the other hand, you'd say that if it's a longer match, the guys are going to get more tired. But I'd still rather see them play play classical games when they're tired than the, the, even than, than playing rapid chess when they're slightly more healthy and fit. I, you know, I just, okay, if they get tired... 
then you have you have kind of the effects that you have of of the of the fast games and that they might make more mistakes but that seems like it's it's kind of more a part of of the of the standard uh you know classical format than than what they did which just just feels kind of arbitrary so i i would uh you know i i i i would just rather see uh them not have the the uh the rapid playoff but but just from historical uh a point of view it's kind of interesting when you go back in time if you you know like go back to let's say some of the candidates matches from from the from the 80s now this is back before they had digital clocks even and, then, and certainly no increment but there was never even a thought of deciding these things by any kind of fast chess you know they had candidates matches that would that were ultimately decided by a roulette uh, spin of the roulette wheel you know, just right. by chance that that was better than, let's say, an Armageddon game, you know? It's yeah. Just, I mean, I think even Armageddon is better than, than flipping a coin, but but it's just uh, it's just only, you know, now it's like, yeah, fast chess, it's great, I guess, mainly because people are literally watching the games. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I do have to admit, I like the fast chess. As a sports fan, to me, it's intuitive because, like, in football and basketball, um, American football, that is, uh, you know, after the regulation time, they speed it up and just keep going. So, but I get it. I, I get why the classicists, um, you know, don't want the format changed. And I get that it's a different skill set. But I, I have to confess, I, I come down a little more on the side of my friend Greg Shahadi on this one. But um, I, I have to, I have to, I have to just to jump in and say that, you know, I've, I've read many things that, uh, Greg has written, and he he is he is a fountain of, of ideas. But I I disagree with almost everything that he writes. <laughs> yeah, M- most most emphatically about the part about uh, the one he wrote about how oh you know getting old doesn't mean that you can, you can't be just as good as chess. You know, like uh, I'm 38 years old and I'm in the best shape of my life. Yeah. But you don't have children. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I agree with that's that what, one. That's what he doesn't understand. It's that your life changes. It's not just that you get older. Yeah, my uh, our, you you know Donnie Ariel. Um, yes. I hope I hope I'm not. Uh, yeah. Hope I'm yeah. not airing something that was supposed to be off the record. But Donnie at some point said he wanted Greg to have kids so that it would wipe the smile off his face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I totally get it. it it's uh yeah, Greg. Greg has a special a special set of circumstances. I mean, great guy. God bless him. But but yeah, um, it, I mean, that... once upon a time, I had an easy life like that. I was living in my Manhattan apartment, and I could you know wake up at uh, ten o'clock every day if I wanted to. But you know, people's lives change. Yeah, and and kids overall are a blessing, but they don't they don't help your chess skill. That's for sure. Um, right. Do your uh, kids play any chess, Joel? Uh, my son plays a little bit. Uh, actually he's, he's become a little bit of a fan, uh, so that now, uh, you know, sometimes I go to tournaments, I, I, I bring a chess board and I get all the players to, to sign it, you know, cause he, he loves that kind of thing. That really started from the charity chess event when mm-hmm. he met Fabiano and he got Fabiano to, you know, Fabiano's signature and he took a picture with him. So, um, so he likes chess and he, he watches my shows sometimes but uh, he, he has not been in a USCF tournament, and he's he's a little bit hesitant about it, you know, because he's got big shoes to fill. You know, I, I, I tell him over and over again, I, I don't expect you to be as good as me. I really, it's not important. I just want you to enjoy the game. But, you know, I don't know how far he's going to he's gonna take it. And my daughter at this point uh, has expressed zero interest in chess. And how old are your kids? Uh, my son is ten, and my daughter is will be imminently turning eight. Okay, yeah, it seems like players players of your level, it's it's more common than not that that the kids, as you allude to, feel like they might have big big shoes to fill. Well, um, it's a, it's a historical fact that there has never been a uh, a grandmaster whose child became a grandmaster. That's never happened. That's a really good point. I, I and you know, you've had you've had. Uh, uh, you know, like if you look at sports, you've seen, you know, um, uh, children of, of, of great players of the Hall of Famers, you know, have, have tremendous professional careers. It's, but it hasn't really happened in chess. Yeah, I'm racking my brain trying to think if there's anyone on the horizon. And uh, I can, no, no one jumps to mind. But, but yeah, that's interesting. 
Um, so Joel, you've written, I mean, you've written, uh, a lot about sort of, you, you touch on a lot of your games in your books and especially in American Grandmaster, you sort of write in a very personal way about them, but I'm endeavoring to talk more about what guests favorite games are. And I know you highlighted a few in, in the things that you've written, but do you have one game above all that, that comes to mind? Oh, uh. It's, putting you on the spot. It's hard. Yeah, I, I might give you. I might give you more, uh, more than one. Uh, uh, that works. What one of, uh, one of my all-time favorite games was a win I had over, <clears throat> over Yasser Sarawan in the U.S. Junior Championship in, nineteen eighty, uh, and one of the reasons I love this game is because I played it when I was sixteen years old. And I don't know if I've ever played a better game after that, you know, with all that I that I learned since. So I would say that, you know, you know, judging on a curve, you know, that was really that that, that could be said to be my my best game. Um, my definitely, you know, like when it comes to favorite moves, there was a game in the New York Open I I, I played when I I sacrifice I made this great uh, bishop sacrifice. Very, a very unlikely bishop sacrifice to open up my opponent's king and and get uh, get my queen into the game and get a, a winning counterattack. What uh, game was the, what game was that? There was against Abramovich, and basically the game only exists is, is only known to man because I sent it to the combination section of the informant at the time. So I only the the, the moves only exist from the. Um, you know, from the point where the combination starts, the first 40 moves of the game are not in any database, and I don't personally have them. Oh, funny. Do you, <laughs> yeah. Was that in uh, in any of your books, that combination? Uh, yeah, it's in all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's, in, it's an American Grandmaster, uh, and it's, yeah, and it's in, it's in Better Thinking, Better Chess. I mean, that is the one thing that, that if you are a Joel Benjamin fan and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and you get my books that there there has been yeah there has been a little bit of a, a little bit of repetition there because but didn't using the you know first in american grandmaster presenting the games as games but here they they're they're presented in a thematic way and right. and i just want, want to give you one more game i'd say the the best game that i was involved in not necessarily the best game that i played was a game that i lost to Lyos portish in the 1987 interzonal because it was really a great up and down game with crazy complications where his his king I was black and his king actually marched all the way to G6 and I I wasn't able to to uh surround it uh, successfully but uh, that was that was I, I thought the best game that I was involved in Okay, so I'm going to link to those games in the show description just as a, as an aside for listeners. I haven't been talking about games too much because obviously this is an audio only format. So to me, it's not the most natural fit. But you, <laughs> but you guys give me a shout and let me know if you want to hear more of that from guests or less of that. And I'm happy to discuss it or not discuss it. But in any event, I, I look forward to reviewing those games in more detail. I mean, having... Having been going through your books recently, I did. I remember the Sarawan game, and it, um, it's quite nice. Um, and speaking of your playing, so Joel, you still manage to play. I think you said about four times a oh, year. Oh, hold on! I should jump in and say that uh, now that I remember, that Sarawan game was actually played in 1979, and I was 15. I don't know how I got that wrong. But it was seventy nine that the game. Well, I'm I'm amazed how many details you remember generally from these games. I mean, <laughs> it, it's uh it's quite impressive, and it's very you know I, I like I said before I want to get to American Grandmaster, but the memories are so vivid that it's uh yeah. it's pretty cool to relive. But first, let's talk about more recent ones. So you were in St. Louis, uh, I think it was about a month ago, um, playing in an invitational. How how did that go? <laughs> Well, um, I, I, I was uh, kind of surprised to get an invitation because, um, you know, old people usually, uh, well, I mean, you know, tournaments usually don't pay much attention to, to the, the older players. You know, they, they want to have the hot young players. And, and also there are so many grandmasters that are easily accessible to, you know, to St. Louis because there's so many college programs out there. But uh I had, uh, you know, I approached them about senior chess, and uh, and they thought like, oh yeah, like, well, we should have some of these guys out here. Uh, so hopefully, I'm the first and not the last, and they'll be inviting, you know, some of my colleagues out to play in these tournaments. But I thought that it was a really kind of interesting experiment. I was playing in a tournament. It was the Winter Classic B, and they have on a regular basic basis they have these these uh, invitational tournaments. 
these grandmaster events, and they usually have two sections. The top section is sort of like 2,600 players, and the second section is basically 2,500 players. And so I played in the, in the in the B group, and a lot of the field was were, were players that were one third my age. So you know, I mean, talk about an age gap. I mean, that was crazy. Um, but it was very interesting for me to to play against a new generation. And in fact, a lot of the players in the tournament. Uh, I didn't even really know what they looked like because I have been to so few open tournaments in the last few years. Uh, you know, I don't even know what people look like. I just see names, you know, when I do my show. So it was kind of interesting, the, the competition. But, uh, you know, and I, I didn't do all that well because I I had too many, as the commentator Jesse Cry put it, uh, senior moments. <laughs> and I know I just find that, you know, that my blundering is really bad these days and i i just gave away a few games the games that i lost i lost three games in tournament they were just terrible but also there was one game i drew where i had a completely winning position you know one that i really would normally win in my sleep and i drew against michaleski which ended up helping him uh go on to tie for first so so i finished minus one in the in the tournament and uh this, like all tournaments, gives me mixed signals because I look at the games and I say, like, okay, Joel, you still got it, you know. Your mind is not feeble. You still, you still understand the game. You're still generating good moves. You're showing understanding. But then there are the senior moments. I, know, I notice that, you know, that I ruin too many games, that I don't finish like I used to. And so... You know, I don't know what to do. You know, does it mean I need to play more, or does it mean that I need to concentrate on writing books? <laughs> that, that's interesting that you mentioned that. I mean, I'm obviously I'm I'm younger than you, and I'm way weaker than you, but I sort of struggled with the same issue in a recent tournament. Like for my level, I, most of my moves were pretty good, but then there were just a few stinkers. So, but but, but yeah. a lot of, a lot of it is 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 how often you play, and because I play very infrequently, it's harder for me to be in good form. I really have to play myself into form, you know. Like for instance, in the uh, earlier in the year, in the summertime, I played in the World Senior Team Championship, and you know that tournament, I in the first round I beat a, a low rated player. Then my second game, I, I drew against a 2100. I was still a little bit sleepy from the jet lag. And then I lost my third game to John M. So it's like a really very, very poor start. But then I, I won a game. Uh, you know, then I started winning games, and I ended up beating, beating two, uh, uh, two grandmasters and having a good result in the end. But like every game I won, I just felt so much better. And by the time that I played um, Yusupov, I was on a three-game winning streak, and I actually went into that game very confident, and I won that game as well. So, like I said, when you don't, play, a lot of the part, of, a lot of the problem for older players is that if you don't play frequently, then it's just much much harder to turn it on. Yeah. So you don't you don't feel like you have the secret in terms of what the prescription would be, other than just play more, which is not always feasible. It's not feasible. Yeah. It's just it's just you know. I mean, I got kids. I got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's you know it's and and, and there are you know uh, there are guys my age that 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 play more often and they you know generally find better a better form and able to play up to their expectations. Uh, I see my you know my FIDE rating is now closer to twenty a lot closer to twenty five hundred than it is to twenty six hundred. Mm -hmm. And and I I look at the players that I play against and uh, guys out there what their ratings are and. You know, like a twenty six fifty player to me is not a hundred and thirty points stronger than me. Right. Just, you know, because I, I mean, I used to beat guys like that. So, um, you know, I feel like I'm really underrated, but I don't know if I'm genuinely underrated when I go into a tournament and I haven't played for for three months. You know, because I just I, I don't really perform at the level that um, you know that my understanding is at now. Yeah, and at this stage of your career, with all all that you've accomplished, how much does it bother you? Like, uh, how how easy, how quickly do you forget it when you get back home? It it, uh, it it bothers me, but I can I can accept it because I just understand that that's that's how my life is now, and it's it's very 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 rich in in other ways. But I I do 
have this vision that, you know, when my kids are a little bit older and more independent, that, um, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. And I, I also would like to be active on the senior circuit. But, you know, right now the biggest problem is that there just isn't, there just isn't a lot of money in senior chess. And I, 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 can't, I can't afford to go out to the senior championship and, you know, spend all that money on, on travel and hotel uh, and, and take, you know, time off and not help the family, not make money in other ways. I just can't do it. Yeah, that's so, an expensive hobby. So this, yeah, you know, it's just uh, this, this just some some impediments for me to to you know get back into chess and do things the way I'd want to. Yeah, well, I want to get get to the senior tournament in in Dortmund, which I think will also dovetail into your American Grandmaster book that I've teased a few times. But one last question about the Winter Classic: I saw mm-hmm. that uh, Alexi Dreve in the A section kind of put on a clinic, and no, 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 that was not the one I was in. Oh, okay, was that the he, he one before in, it? He was in the fall, and of course, okay. he, he's a guy that's roughly from my generation. He's actually yeah. a little bit younger than me. <laughs> uh, even yeah. he's a senior, but he's young, a little younger than me. But um, yeah, so that's the thing. But the thing is that Dreyev has is still plays. He yeah, still plays. and uh, and that makes it a lot easier for him to, to keep up his lo- his level. But yeah, and I I, uh, I talked about that result on my show, and I said, you know, as always, you know, uh, this this is this is uh, what you say when people say tell you there's no counterplay for old men. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good line. Yeah. Um, Okay, so getting back to Dortmund, so you went to this U.S. team senior championship, and it was like you were you were getting the band back together, Shabalov and Yermo and Sergei Kudrin and uh, Jan Elvis all there with you. So uh, you talked a little about the chess, but what was the overall experience like? Well, I mean, really, uh, you know, that that getting the band back together is, is is a major impetus for wanting to go, and that's why. Well, I mean, I always felt that Olympiads in general were were the best tournaments, the the, the most uh, satisfying. And um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the guys, you know, didn't or couldn't or wouldn't whatever go to the, t- the tournament. Like we couldn't convince Larry Christensen to go, and uh, Greg Kaidanov had a, had a prior commitment he couldn't get out of. And um, what's what's Larry Christensen up to, if I may interject? I, I think. I, I think he just uh, I think he just teaches a lot. Unfortunately, he just he doesn't like to go anywhere, mm-hmm. and uh, we can't seem to get, on, <laughs> get travel. Because I mean, if I were him, I would be going to tournaments all the time. Because uh, he and the he and Natasha don't have any kids, and uh, I'm sure their financial situation is a lot more settled than ours. So I would be traveling if I were him, um, but. Uh, he uh no he he didn't maybe maybe he will uh do this in in the future but he he didn't go but still um you know uh we had uh we heard had uh, Yermo and 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 Shaba and um uh I actually didn't play in that many team events with Shaba um but I played a lot with uh, with Yermo and uh and those are great experiences you know you feel like you play those games you feel like you're going down in the trenches, you know, with, with, with your mates. And, uh, right. and, uh, it just, uh, it just, uh, the, the games feel a bit me- more meaningful, but it was really a great experience. Um, I, I know I have to give all credit to, to, uh, to Alex and Alex because they, um, they just planned out everything, you know, like they, they rented a car, which they, they, they brought over from the West and, uh, and uh, they, you know, we, we the, the games were at 930 in the morning, I guess, because we're old people, you wow. know, <laughs> I mean, I have kids, so I can get up in the morning now. Right. Um, so we were done basically by lunchtime. We had the whole day. So we we'd just we get in the car and we'd go somewhere. We'd have we'd have nice meal. Sometimes we have a nice lunch or a nice dinner. We do some sightseeing. It was tremendously relaxing time. It was just really, really fun. And, and that helped a lot, you know. We were we were very relaxed, uh, even though in some sense there was a lot of pressure on us because you know we were able to get um, USCF funding for the tournament. I mean, not a huge amount; it was enough to cover our expenses. Um, but okay, that made it worthwhile if we could go and not lose money. Yeah, you know, we were we were ready to go, and um, you know we felt that uh you know to have any chance of u s teams going in the future, we had to bring home the gold medal 
so we were very relieved to be able to do that in the end. Yeah, and uh, just want to echo that it's great that U.S. Chess supported that sort of thing, and I'm certainly in favor of uh, of you know players of, of your stature and experience um, getting to to represent the country in events like that. And of course, I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall, I'm sure, some of, <laughs> some of the misadventures you guys had, <laughs> whatever you were doing uh, with the meals uh, in between rounds. Well, you know, there, there, it's not a, not, a lot of, uh, not a lot of misadventures these days, you know, because we're, we're old people. <laughs> um, you know, for instance, our, our youngest player on the team, uh, Al Shabalov, who I was, I was referring to as barely legal because he was, <laughs> he was only 50. Right. Uh, although he's turned, he's, he turned 51 later in the year. Um, but he's a grandpa. <laughs> oh, really? He's a grandfather. Yes, yes. So, you know, put that in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, so do you have any uh, tournaments coming up? Uh, I don't have any tournaments coming up to play in. <laughs> hmm. I have tournaments coming up to coach and, you know, this is, it's a kind of a busy schedule. I'm going to, to Orlando with, uh, with, uh, Columbia grammar with my, you know, long time, uh, team that I've coached. And, you know, we, we both go back to those days. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess probably the cities and States after that. So I'll be doing a lot of that. And of course, you know, when I go places, I'm going to be <laughs> trying to get people to buy my new book, which I, I really think it's a good book, a very good book. I'm very, very, very pleased with how it, you know, came out. There's always times when I think I could have done something maybe a little bit better, but I think, I think it's a good book. I think it's a new kind of book. And I think, I think that people will be pleased with it, that they'll, they'll feel that they, they're going to learn something from it. Yeah, I agree. And it can benefit a wide range of ratings. I mean, certainly at my level, there's tons I can learn from it. And I think that it's not so inaccessible that someone, you know, I would say, what do you think, 1600 on up or something like that? Yeah, you know, people ask me that question. And I'd say, well, I'd say, well, let's say if you're if you're 1200, you'll 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 get you'll a lot of the concepts will be very useful. Uh, For instance, this. one thing I, I did something along the lines of, that I did in liquidation is is I have I have a little chapter where I just give I just give advice you know I give like forty pieces of yeah, advice for thinking yeah, it's a nice right finish. yeah and so so like you know even if you're twelve hundred player just reading that section you'll benefit from it most of the chess will be over your head right so yeah I, I would say that uh, to, you know for uh, you know a stronger player will will uh you know profit more because they'll be able to follow the 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 harder chess but uh it's, yeah i think 1600 would benefit and i'd say uh you know for players like 2000 2100 will 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 really benefit tremendously especially because they're very similar to the category in which uh you know uh some of my students represented in the book are so they they can really un it really speak to them, you know, that, that, uh, that experience in chess. Yeah. Yeah. That was definitely, I was nodding my head a lot in in reading it for sure. Um, so Joel, one other topic I would be remiss if I didn't discuss, uh, I mentioned that, that Greg Shahadi and I were big fans of unorthodox opening way back in the day, but he, but the Shahadis also had a subscription to chess chow and, <laughs> and there was, there was nothing more exciting than when a new issue came. So, um, for for our younger listeners, why don't you just spend a couple minutes just talking about? I mean, I know you go into this in American Grandmaster, but telling the story briefly of Chess Chow. Well, Chess Chow came about um, at the beginning of the nineties. I I had just uh, moved into Manhattan, and I was uh, sharing a gigantic apartment with uh, international master Mark Ginsburg, who's an old old friend of mine, and. Uh, he also uh, he actually worked in computers. So he was very savvy and uh, you know understood something about desktop publishing. <laughs> so we said, "Hey, let's put out a funny chess magazine." And we you know eventually you know hit upon Chess Chow, Feed Your Mind, and so we we put out this this magazine, which was a strange combination of things. It was certainly humor. Uh, it was some instructive chess. We, we leaned on our buddies to 
uh, to provide us content, which we almost never paid them for because we <laughs> we had no money. But, you know, they sort of did a lot of stuff as a favor. Like my, my good buddy Michael Wilder would write his agony column, which was absolutely hysterical. Um, but I would say one thing about the magazine. It was, a very, it was a very funny magazine, but I look back on it now and I just see like, Oh, I took all kinds of shots at people who were not my friends, you know, right, yeah. the people were my friends, you know, and wrote for me and stuff, you know, they were, but, um, I look back on it now and I actually, I actually cringe a little bit about it because, um, you know, now that I'm older and wiser, I, I, I would, you know, take a different tone with that and, uh, um, you know, not, uh, you know, not try to embarrass people so much. So it really was, you know, from a different time of my life, you know, when I was, you know, I was in my late 20s then, and I would do things a little bit differently. But the magazines are, are very entertaining. Yeah, they're very funny. And there's just, there's just nothing like it. I mean, so for listeners, I would describe it. It's I mean, it's obviously, as Joel said, it's a satirical magazine for chess. But uh, I've, I've never seen anything resembling it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, it, yeah, and it, it was very funny, and there was chess content too. I mean, obviously, with written written by players so strong, you 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 could learn some chess in between the yeah. chuckles. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and there was, and you know, sometimes we'd have you know theoretical articles, and they and they were pretty uh, pretty hard hitting. But of course, this was still this is still time a time before chess engines were particularly useful. So it was all just you know uh, you know analysis from you know blood, sweat, and tears. And do you have a stack of them sitting somewhere, or, or are they all? Uh... <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, I that's do funny because you know we didn't sell that many of them. Although there are there are some issues that are almost non-existent that I have very few copies. But basically, they were they were sitting in my parents' house for a long time, and I eventually cleaned out what I could. So yeah, the magazine still exists in printed form. Unfortunately. It doesn't exist on the computer because those files were lost. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, you know, to do something with it, we'd have to we'd have to uh, scan the, the the material back in. Um, you know, Mark and I talked about it, but we just we never actually acted on it. And um, you know, part of part of me part of me remember, you know sees the cringe factor. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how much I you know want to to. Uh, you know, to, to proceed with it, but yeah, uh, maybe you could pick the highlights, but then it's like more work. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, totally understandable. All right. So Joel, I want to finish with American Grandmaster, which um, I have to say to listeners, it, it, it's, it's the most, it's probably the, the most in the spirit of this podcast book I've ever read. Somehow it had escaped my attention until preparing for this interview. But I mean, it's a great combination of yes, there are games in it. And yes, you can learn chess from it, but just so many stories. So uh, I highlighted a few and you're welcome to tell stories that are in the book or other stories from the travel from your travels. But here are a few that were my personal favorites. Uh, describing uh, Kasparov having his own toilet at the Olympiad. I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, Which we were prepared to break into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so do you, could you tell listeners uh, what that experience was like and we can reflect on how conditions have improved at least a little bit for uh, for elite players like yourself? Well, I, you know, I haven't been to a lot of these uh, team tournaments for a while. Uh, I mean, I've gone to, more recently, I've gone to a lot of the junior events, but not being a player, I didn't really have to see what the facilities were like. But, you know, remember that, uh, you know, a lot of these places are what you might call third world countries. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes the bathrooms have what uh, what we commonly call Turkish toilets. And, you know, with, with, with my uh, um, upbringing, I don't think I could <laughs> use one of those. But, you know, very often the, the uh, you know, when you get, when you get 1,000, 2,000 people together, there's, there's often going to be a lot of germs spreading around and people get sick and stuff. And, uh, you know, like if, you, <laughs> if you've got diarrhea and not the best, uh, you know, toilet facilities, and, and you run into problems. Yeah, so this was the uh, 96 Olympiad in, in Armenia, right? Yeah, which was otherwise a really fun event, e- even though there was, there was almost like a, uh, I think there was almost like a coup that I think it was they were sort of uh, you know clamping down on it so there was a lot, a lot of police presence <laughs> so it's it a little bit weird but um, but it was a, it was a fun tournament. Okay, another another story I highlighted was uh, 
Larry Christensen and Ivan Sokolov racing around a lake? Is that-, that was from the Blair, <laughs> Blair Olympiad. <laughs> yeah, Larry, Larry realized his only chance was to cheat, so there was, uh, there was some kind of hidden bicycle <laughs> that he was supposed to use, but I think the handoff <laughs> didn't quite work out, so... He wasn't. He wasn't able. And was there a bet on this uh, race, or was yeah, it just? There, there was a bet. Yeah, I don't remember the uh, the parameters of it. Yeah. But, and yeah. speaking of betting, I mean, you mentioned uh, one of the world juniors where Kasparov was a young phenom, but not world champion yet. Him taking on all comers in uh, in blitz, and you playing him yourself. Yes, and he he would give me. Uh, he gave me five to three, which I guess was kind of an honor because. My uh, my second for the event was Michael Wilder, and he got he got five to two. <laughs> huh. he, was, he was treated with less respect, but uh, but yeah, that was the first opportunity I had to play Kasparov. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play him in the real tournament because I just played so badly. I didn't get paired with him. I mean, he played almost everybody in the upper half of the cross table, but not me. So uh, I was happy to play with him, and I have to say that uh, that you know the the young Kasparov, you know. Without uh, without a lot of entourage back then, he was he was a really nice, friendly guy, and he was uh, I, I you know I had that I had that experience with him until 1996, and then things changed after that. <laughs> yeah, so 1996, of course, you're referring to your work on Deep Blue, which you, which you also discuss in great detail. Well, it was really it was really 97 that things went wrong in the second match, but uh, yeah, that uh, he uh, let's put it this way: he's not a good loser. Yeah, yes. uh, when he, he when he when he loses, he finds re- other reasons for it. Yeah, I don't think we're uh, we're shocking many listeners with with that revelation. But yeah, I mean it's um well detailed, and uh, you know he's been reticent. I mean he's been um I don't know the right word, but he's walked back some of the things he said in his brasher years be- these because days. there's no coherent theory that he has. Yeah, so he can't really do much with it. Yeah, and, and in this day and age, like you know, having to argue about why a computer beat a person in chess. Like it's, it's not an argument. Well, (laughs) you know, like when when you say like, there's no way that, that, uh, that, that deep blue, this computer deep blue would not take those two pawns that it could take. And that you, you, you you sit at your, your, your laptop and you turn on your, your, your commercial engine. And uh, within a few seconds, it sees not to take the, the pawn. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, future events proved that that you know computers could have a you know could have a, a higher I, in air quotes level of understanding. Um, it's just that uh, we weren't used to it then. But then, of course, you know, Deep Blue for its time was uh, was just a whole different animal. Yeah, yeah, it was so revolutionary at the time. And um, so, what's your? You mentioned. Uh, before we're recording again, that you're not like particularly tech savvy, but how good are you with with engines in terms of your own uh, work for your students and on on your chest when you get a chance to do it? Um, well, the thing is, the thing is that I work with engines. I spend a lot of time on engines, and uh, I, I, I don't really call that tech, but <laughs> uh, from my point of view, but. Uh, but I, I, I lean on them quite heavily because it's just just the fact, you know, the, the fact of the matter that that when you when you you generate any kind of content in chess, it has to be at least engine checked. Otherwise, you know, people rip it apart, you know, because yeah. every, everybody has an engine. So I have to admit that, you know, like I do do my my weekly show on on ICC. OK, thank you. And. I you know I pretty much put put the engine on right away you know yeah. because I know I'm going to have to you know I'm going to have to so I save time but, but one thing that I do uh, and I'm glad this came up because I, I do this in the show but I also do this a lot in the in the in the recent book is I talk about how to understand and use the the information you get from engines because you see players all the time they they. Like like they're, they're watching the world championship match, and their, their their engine is telling them that a certain move is plus one, and you know Fabby plays a move that their engine tells them is plus point five, and they say Fabby blundered, right? And they don't even they don't even have the inkling of an idea as to why one move is even supposed to be a half a point better than the other, 
But, you know, the engine doesn't always give you useful information. Sometimes the engine tells you to play a move that if you played the move, you would lose because you'd have no idea what, what, the, what the point of the move is. And so, so one thing that I talk about, and I even talk about this a little bit in liquidation, is, is that, you know, you, it's whatever the engine says, you have to play moves that you understand, you know, that you can see a move. You can see a move that you think might be a brilliant win, but if you don't really know what the follow-up is going to be and you see another move that you're pretty confident you're going to win if you play that move, that's that's the right move to play. So, uh, like on my show, it generates a lot of crazy computer variations, and I give a lot of them because they're very entertaining, but I also am quick to say, you know, this is something that's never going to happen. You know, it's just fun <laughs> fun to look at, but it's it's not realistic. Yeah, I think in a couple of key moments in in the Carlson Caruana match, Svidler said that very thing, like in real time, where where because they you know they I know that you watch some of it as well, and they don't look at the engine themselves, but people are yelling at them in the chat from what they see in the engine. I'm really I'm really glad they they don't look at the engines. I have to say that I also looked at a lot of this the uh, the the the, uh, the commentary from St. Louis, and and I, I wish. I wish it was more Yasser without the computer and less Maurice with the computer because Maurice tends to uh, tends to exaggerate things based on having the computer analysis and and makes it seem like certain things are obvious about the position because he's got proof of it from the computer and they're they're really not you know like if you're watching Svidla and Grishuk you'll see that they're often struggling more with the position than Maurice is because they're looking at it in 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 a, in a human way which is which is how Carlson and Carolina are looking at the position they don't get to use get to use a computer but uh yeah i i, I did uh i did enjoy uh, watching commentary and i uh, and I, I was watching uh, Svidler uh, mostly in that in that crazy uh, end game that that Carolina missed a complicated win. And Svidler was saying saying like the engine score doesn't really matter un- unless we see it jumping because that means that something something changed. Right. But That's a good uh, point. and I talk about this a lot in liquidation on the chessboard because that book was. Uh, one of the difficulties of writing that book was that the that in a lot of positions the engine does not help at all because it just says this move is plus 2.5 and this move is plus 2.5 and so is this one and this one and this one so basically it's, it's just like it's saying you're winning and you say like well why am i winning yeah you're just winning but but how do i win it Oh, right. that I don't know, <laughs> because they they don't understand the concept of 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 needing to make progress. It's not a computer. It does that doesn't show up in the evaluation. Fortunately, table bases come into play. Um, I believe that they're now up to seven. Although I don't know if the average person has access to seven piece uh, table bases or not. I know that anybody can check out a six piece table base on the internet and I used six piece table bases in liquidation on the chessboard and they were very, very helpful. And I tried my best to explain what I learned from, from, from that. <clears throat> but oh, sorry. Uh, I just want to interject with a quick explainer for listeners. So okay. what, what Joel's referring to is if there's six or seven pieces or fewer, every position is solved. You can just put it into a computer and it will tell you, is this position a win or not? Um, so, and seven, he's saying, well, the rest I think is self-explanatory, but seven may not be like publicly available, but yeah, six is. I, I don't know about that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that seven, seven piece now exists, but you know, like the, 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 the worst type of ending is one that let's say has eight pieces on board. And remember the Kings count as pieces, right? So if it's eight pieces on the board, table base doesn't help unless you, you reach a position where there's some more trading, um, but the engines are often very poor in analyzing that. Now, of course, there was this particular type of animal called cess, which I had never heard of cess before. But apparently cess is some guy out there that's running the Stockfish program on a very, very powerful computer. Am I, am I right about that? Yep, that's right. And and cess was it's, – it's, it's not that Svidler and Grishik were using cess. It's that everybody, everybody yeah. watching was, and they're saying like, Seth says 2.5 for white, 
But, you know, it's almost like an alpha zero um, evaluation. It's like it, it, it's like telling somebody what's going to happen in 20 years. You know, it's like, how do you get there? You know, it's, it's not useful to know the end result if you don't know, really know how to get there. And um, so it's 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 a kind of truth, you might say, but it's not necessarily useful in in terms of playing the game because it's based on analysis that's so deep that that nobody is actually finding it. Even the commentators aren't getting that deep, you know, when they can move pieces around on a board. Yeah, and it was funny. Sus would have like twenty five thousand viewers all all suddenly able to you know pontificate with a uh, super GM level analysis. Um, and I did. Uh, I I had a suspicion that this was true, but I just wanted to double check. And Lee Chess does now have a seven piece table base available for free. Um, just just for the record, but but uh, yeah, okay, yeah. okay, that's great. So. So that uh, that will be for use use in future liquidations. I I'm, I'm confessing that I did not I did not check any pieces in in seven uh, any 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 position with seven pieces on the table base. Although uh, I, I I don't know if that was a, a big factor in any of the positions, but uh, I will be looking for that in the future. Yeah, prob- probably doesn't uh, doesn't change the overall value of the book too much. I'm guessing. But also, I don't know. I don't know like what kind of effect that has on your computer or what you know whether you have to have a. I mean, I want. I, I wouldn't want to download anything because that would just. I mean, that would just you know probably freeze your computer, or bring your computer to a virtual standstill to have. Right. You know, so it has to be something that you can easily just use. Uh, you know, just from from a website. Yeah. So, Joel, just a couple more topics, if you don't mind. Not at all. Oh, excellent. This is this has been quite a treat. I really appreciate it. Um, so, number one, I'm sure you've you've asked this many times, but what are what are your favorite chess books? Ah, okay. Well, you know, uh, when I was a kid, I read a lot of chess books, and I have, I guess, a fairly big library. But you know, the the great majority of the books came, you know, when I was. 10, 11, 12 years old. And, you know, it's quite understandable because uh, I was born in 1964. So we just had books. We didn't, right, <laughs> we didn't, we else, didn't have, yeah. we didn't have computers. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have any other way to learn, but books. So books were very, very important then. So I had a lot of them and I read a lot of the old books. And I, I confess that I, I read far fewer books now, although I, I I am a big fan of reading books. I think that it's I think that people need to read more books, you know, if they want to improve. And I'm not I'm not really expecting to improve at this point, but if they want to improve, they should read more books. But you know, there were some books from the old days that were very very influential to me. Um, one of them was called How to Open a Chess Game, and it was a book where chapters were contributed from several prominent grandmasters of the day. So like there was one from Ben Larson, Larry Evans, Tigran Petrosian. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I think Carries, maybe Carries. I'm I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I think Carries also. Uh, so this is written in the mid seventies, I guess. Uh, and, uh, I just thought it was fascinating because it wasn't just like, okay, here's some opening lines to memorize. It's it's like really how to approach the opening. And and one of the grandmasters told the story about how he read some analysis which said, you know, okay, and you play queen b4, and if knight c6, you boldly take the pawn on b7. And he says, okay, I played into the position, and the guy just defended his b7 pawn, and then he brought out his knight and chased my queen around. <laughs> but the, the book didn't say anything about that, you know. So it's like the the perils of of leaning on on uh, things you read without without analyzing them for yourself. So I thought that was really a tremendous book. That was one of my fav- favorites. Okay. Fl- so Vlasic Neil Horde, I think, also had a chapter. Yeah, I, it's I just I piqued my curiosity because I hadn't heard of it, and it's still on Amazon. Gligorich also had a chapter. Gligorich, wow. yes, yes. I I got to play Grig- Gligorich many years later. I mean, I got I got to play I guess a lot of the guys in the book. It's a great treat. So that was one of my early favorites. Another another book that was tremendously influential to me. And this is this is from a um, a chess author who is in the uh, is in the U.S. Hall of Fame for his for his writing, 
and uh, he's written a lot of books. But uh, when he really writes on serious topics, they're the they're the best ones. This is Andy Soltis wrote a book called Pawn Structure Chess. Yes, yeah. And this book was was awesome, and it was really it was groundbreaking. Now. I think people since have, have tried to write similar books, and maybe they've done a good job. I think, in general, the book writing, standard of writing, is better now than it used to be. But um, the, the, the idea was the book was written on uh, along the lines of chess structures. So it's like a King's Indian structure and, uh, and a French defense structure and a Caracan structure. And so you learned about how to... You know how to use pawn breaks and and how to how to you know maneuver pieces and what to trade and all that stuff. So it was you know giving a lot of really important strategy that you know I think a lot of people don't ever learn. So that was tremendously influential. So I think those were the two books that I learned from most. And I'm going to just point out one other book from my childhood that I loved. It was by I. A. Horowitz and it was called uh, Chess. Uh, I may not get the right the order right. Traps, pitfalls, and swindles. It may I may I may have reversed the order there, but it was those three words, and it was really basically you know like a whole bunch of games and positions where you know one player had this tricky idea and the other player saw further, and sometimes the first player saw further still in the end. But it was sort of like uh, it was almost a little bit like elements of the book that I just wrote, you know about this thinking, you know, about how to outthink your opponent. And I thought it was just a really wonderful book, and I, I enjoyed it tremendously. Okay, those are great recommendations. And uh, the Pawn Structure book by Andy Soltis, who uh, we fairly recently had on the podcast, and I know you've, you've played over the years, yeah, that one has been recommended, one. but the other two are brand new. So, uh, uh, And I can tell you that I also read all three books in dinosaur notation. Oh, man, yeah. (laughs) Although I think I may have the the Horowitz book. I may have that in algebraic notation now. I'm not sure. Um, You know, I think think they've – I hope they were reprinted in – in uh, yeah. break. I know that the, the, the How to Open a Chess Game, I believe that was RHM Publishing back then, and uh, the other ones I don't know. But um, yeah, uh, they were really great books. And uh, there, I mean, there are more. There are more excellent books today. I think. I think that the the general level of writing is just is just so much more enlightened now, especially because we have so many more chess teachers and coaches and trainers that that the, the people who write books are much more in tuned with with presenting information in ways that people can understand them you know which was different from back then a lot of the books that are written were just oh i know all this stuff and now i'm going to present it to you to show how smart i am and they weren't necessarily as accessible i i just think that a lot of a lot of authors do that these days so i think they're I think there are a lot of useful books out there. There are also a lot of terrible books, of course. There's going to be more terrible books because now anybody can publish a book. Right, yeah. And so there's going to be a lot more terrible books as well. But uh, but I think the, the general level of professional writing is, is pretty high. Yeah, I agree. All right, Joel, one one more topic, if you don't mind. If there's, mm-hmm. I mean, I I know you've played Kramnik, you've played Anon, you've played so many legends, right. and you tell so many stories. So if there are any other stories that come to mind uh, that, that you feel um, like drinking stories, gambling stories, anything <laughs> a, anything fun from all your, your travels and uh, adventures over the years. Yeah. Well, I'm not a gambler. I did, I did, uh, I did imbibe in the old days, certainly. Um, <laughs> In general, and and as uh, in having read American Grandmasters, you know that uh, that basically almost all my stories involve John, John Fedorovich. Yes. So I've, I've told him many times that he's got to he's got to write a book. You know, he's just got to. He's got to come on the podcast uh, too. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got to he's got to write an autobiography, and it would be it would be, be really it would be really awesome. I mean, he's just he's just very lazy about writing. You know, he just. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to work with him on it. I mean, it would really be be a great book. But uh, but anyway, you mentioned some of those other guys. Uh, I, I I just sort of uh, point to one one moment in time when I was I was sort of on the cusp from going from you know somebody who was uh, you know a good player you know like a top forty player to someone that you know had a chance to to really make a big splash. It was from the PCA qualifier in in Groningen in mm-hmm. 1993, 
And I started off the tournament really fast. I, I got three early wins. I remember I beat Patrick Wolf in the first round. And then uh, I had one or two draws in there, but I but I defeated um, I defeated Ilya Smirin and Yevgeny Bereyev. So I was really on a roll. And I was playing all these top players. And basically, uh, plus three was sort of a leading score. And in the end, plus three, you know, for the listeners, that means win- winning three more games than you lose. Plus three was a qualifying score. And the qualifiers got to play in the candid- PCA Candidates, which was held in uh, in uh, Trump Plaza. Um, you know, of course, at, at that time, I had no way of knowing that that would be a building I would not want to be in. You know, <laughs> things were totally right. different yeah, back before then. Before it was notorious. You're yeah. right. Um, but uh, so anyway, I, I, played, I played all these big names. And a lot of these guys were, you know, were sort of known, but still quite young. Like I played... Um, Kromnik would have been like 17 years old, but he was still, you know, like world class. And I got to jump on him in the opening, you know, like what? <laughs> and right. I had a great position, but then I took a draw because I was running low on time and I, I didn't really see what to do. I played to Pawlov and I got a better position with black, but I couldn't really do anything. So that, that was a draw. Uh, I played Anand and I went crazy trying to beat him. I don't know why, but I just thought oh, I'm going to checkmate Anand. And I had a, a probably a winning attack, but uh, but it was very very complicated. Even with the computers, and he beat back my attack, and he won the game. He dropped me to plus two, and then I had all these games where I had all these winning positions against you know a lot of leading grandmasters of the day like Predrag Nikolic and uh, uh, Sergei Tivyakov and uh, Yaron Paquet. I, I had winning positions all those games. Against Tivyakov at one point, I was, the computer said, plus four. And I drew all these games. I stayed at plus two, and then I lost to Romanishan in the last round. Probably got the easiest pairing of all of them. So, you know, I was right up there with all these, all these you know, top guys who were trying to get into the candidates and uh, didn't quite make it in the end. But, you know, it was like I was one of them at that time. Uh, so that was uh, that was you know kind of a, a great experience to be there. Yeah, I mean, uh, inc- incredible showing, and I'm sure it's a. I mean, oh, I I guess you have enough perspective now where it's probably uh, more um, recall it more fondly than than like you know fixating on the near miss of uh, yeah almost, yeah, almost it, qualifying. It hurt, you know, it hurt, but uh, but I was still proud of what I was was, was able to to achieve and. Um, um, I don't know for you know for fans out there like for the for young fans who who you know weren't around for the old days and and you know don't really know how to look at the old players. Um, you have to understand the ratings today are so much higher now than they used to be. Like my peak, the peak rating I had for my career is twenty six twenty, but twenty six twenty was really maybe like twenty seven hundred today. You know, it was it was. Uh, you know, I say world class, you know, I mean, it wasn't top 10, but it was, you know, it was up there. Um, and, um, you know, like uh, I I beat Peter Svidler in 1997. He was 2660, which is not particularly high rating for today, but he, you know, he was one of the best players in the world like he is today. Yeah. I don't even know if he's if he's stronger now than he is today, but he's 100 points higher. Because right. all the ratings he, are higher. I had him on the show, and he he himself said rating inflation is a real thing. Oh, it's, I'm, yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying that these guys are not strong. It's just, right, of course. It's just yeah. that the ratings are just higher, and also you have to take into a perspective that that all these kids are going to become grandmasters at younger ages than people did in the past. Because for me, it was not it was not really possible to become a grandmaster at 15 or 16, and I. I'm not saying that I necessarily had that level, although I would say I would say that I start to, to date myself as grandmaster level, probably, you know, by, you know, definitely 18 or 19. I was I would say I was a pretty strong grandmaster because I was making in 1983, I finished fourth in the U.S. championship. So I was certainly a grandmaster level player, but I still wasn't a grandmaster until 1986. Because it's very hard to make a 2,600 performance when there are almost no 2,600 players in the world. And one thing people don't, a lot of people don't understand is 
that the Grandmaster Norm was meant to be a world-class performance. It was set at a level where there was almost nobody in the world that had that rating, 2600. And it's still at 2600, even though 2600 is now a run-of-the-mill Grandmaster. So, you know, almost any talented player that uh, that plays, you know, in frequent competitions is, is going to hit that norm just because the players are so high that very often you don't even need a plus score to make a Grandmaster Norm. Uh, you know, for me, like, I made a Grandmaster Norm, my first Grandmaster Norm in 1985 U.S. Championship. The, a rule change made it possible to make a Norm in a national championship. And I needed I needed every bit of plus five to get that Norm, which I did by beating Walter Brown in the last round. So times were different. Yeah, and, and being American-born was a serious hindrance back then as well. Um, why, why, why do you say that? Well, mainly in terms of chasing the norms. I mean, uh, like... yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Be, but but on the other hand, on the other hand, a lot of a lot of tournaments were uh, were formed for the purpose of making norms. Uh, like Goichberg this is the heyday of Goichberg's norm tournaments, and Eric Schiller ran a lot of them. I made I made my first I am norm in a Goichberg tournament. Sorry, I made one I am norm in Goichberg tournament, two I am norms in, in Schiller tournaments. Uh, like in those Goichberg tournaments, I used to I, I used to play in a lot of those with Greg Shahadi's dad back mm-hmm. then. You know, in those days, and a lot of players got titles. Uh, interesting thing about that: when is it better to be a uh, a chess player? Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, today you've got all these tools for becoming becoming uh, great, and and everybody makes faster progress. But the problem is that everybody makes faster progress. So. You've got so much competition out there that, uh, you know, like for guys like, you know, Sam Shanklin, Ray Robson, they're great players, but it's really hard for them to climb to the top, right? Yeah. And for me, you know, um, you know, when I hit 2,500, I was in the top 100 in the world. And this was a time when, you know, most of the, the, the Russian players were stuck in the gulag. They couldn't travel. Mm-hmm. And there were, there were no chess players from China or India, or basically anywhere in India, you know? Like, all the best players that you... All the people you compete against in, in, in these tournaments were Western Europeans, and there weren't nearly as many uh, grandmasters, uh, even from those countries. So, um, you know, when I was uh, 20, uh, 23, I could go to... Um, you know, an open tournament in, in Switzerland and, and, and uh, command an appearance fee. You know, now it's hard for me to go to a tournament where they'll even, you know, give me a hotel room because yeah. it's just, there's just so many guys out there. So, uh, so I, I'm going to say I'm not complaining about the era that I played in because I didn't have these advantages that people had today to where they could, they could maximize their game. But the but the competition was it was easier to rise up in the competition then. So and I and I you know I got to, I, I got to be top forty. So and I you know I have opportunities for more. So I have no complaints about that. Yeah, well, I I think uh, me and you know basically everyone listening w- would have no complaints about having had your career either. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so Joel, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I, uh, enjoyed so much hearing your perspective and I'll, um, in the description of the show, I will put links to the games you mentioned. And of course, to your, your three most recent books. I don't know if you want me to include unorthodox. Nah, openings. I don't even know <laughs> but, if it's in print anymore. With the, yeah, I don't know either. It was, I'm a, sure like, it was a 20 year gap between the first and the second book. Yeah. But well, I will, they... I will write more of them, you know, I, Good, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I will keep writing on, I'm going to try to be, write a book every year. Good. Yeah. And I definitely recommend them. And Joel, uh, I don't know if you're, you're taking students or if you're publicly available or reachable, but if, if any listeners are interested in reaching out, are you open to that or would you prefer not to be? Yes. Uh, I, I, I do have, uh, I do have room for students now. So, so I'm, uh, I'm willing to, to, uh, to take them on. Generally there are, you know, more advanced players, but, uh, but, uh, okay, and should they reach you through chess.com or what's your preferred method for uh, being? Um, they could uh, 
maybe contact me on on facebook okay yeah. that works yeah so so i will link to that and i think that is a wrap joel thank you so much this was awesome okay great and uh and i have to say also that a number of people uh told me that uh, that your show is great and i should go on it so <laughs> so, so so you're you're getting you're getting the good pub too <laughs> good thanks to whoever they are because uh <laughs> yeah this is this has been a treat okay great all right take care joel okay bye Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. That includes my esteemed producer, Matthew Passy, Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music, and Chessable.com for their generous financial support. I also want to thank everyone who helps support the show in little ways. That can be telling a friend about the show, writing something positive about it on social media, or writing a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform. Apparently that stuff really matters. I also want to give special thanks to my PayPal and Patreon Perpetual Partners. As you guys know, I put a lot of time into this show, a lot of research, promotion, actual booking of interviews, doing the interviews. I love the work, but it wouldn't be possible without the generous financial support of the following people. Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com Adam Vrancourge Adrian Gutierrez Alex Pejas Ali Morchetti Brian Mullis I am Carlos Pardomo of ChessAtlanta.com Bill Moran Chad Hilton Chad Oliver Chris Balcom Chris Flanagan Chris Wainscott Christopher Chabri Christopher Wood I am Christoph Zalecki aka Chess Explained Coach Jay's Chess Academy Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Daniel Viney, David Cramley, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith. I am elect Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt. I am Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Yaka Bagard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Bonastia, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jennifer Valens of OffTheRook.com. Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Hartman, John Jernigan, Jen Shahadi, Jen Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, WGM Katerina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Kabbalah Krishnan, Laura Belyovsky, Leo Delgado, Lorraine Dore, Lucia Silva, Matthew Passi, Macaulay Peterson, Martin Habish, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, my main man Moonmaster9000, Nate Salin, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanin, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchak of DiplomatChess.com, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Ryan Stone, Steiner Lima, Stuart Katz, uh, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrinkulj, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and Jivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, everyone. I will catch you guys soon. Bye.